Hello and well, welcome to today's talk. It's Saturday the 21st of August today. Now I want to be thinking about immunity today and it's, I think this is quite an optimistic video now and uh, then in the second half of the video we'll have a, a special report from the United States. Uh, but let's start off with this. Now what got me thinking about this was a couple of days ago we looked at this uh, information here, Delta in the UK, when we're thinking about the difference between natural infection and vaccination and the type of immunity that that generates. So we did notice that Delta infections after two vaccine doses had similar peak levels of virus to those in unvaccinated people. So this was this looked like bad news. Delta infections after two vaccine doses had similar peak levels of virus to those in unvaccinated people, but the numbers were much less. Quite a few people didn't get the infection at all. So that looks bad in terms of spreading the infection on, but the viruses were produced, we believe, for a shorter period of time, although the levels were the same. So that looks bad. But then two doses of either vaccine, same level of protection against infection as natural infection. So what this is saying is two doses of vaccine equals a natural infection in terms of the amount of, amount of immunity you get. But then natural infection followed by vaccination, even more protection than one vaccine alone. And the other thing that was fairly good is after four to five months, similar effectiveness of the two vaccines. And of course, in the UK, that was comparing the Pfizer vaccine and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And the point we were surprised at was the time between doses does not affect prevent uh, does not does not affect effectiveness in preventing new infections. So that was interesting as well. The time between doses does not affect the efficacy in preventing new infections. It may affect the longevity of the vaccine. That is still currently unclear. So that was some new stuff we looked at a couple of days ago, which is 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 really getting quite interesting about the. The immunity here. So, so what's the situation now? Well, we have levels of uh, immunity in the community now, which we did not have last year, for example. And this has got implications for vaccinating children. And it's got uh, another question is, should we use viral or booster shots to top up immunity in adults? So th they're sort of two question marks, really. And it seems like the White House uh, working parties got somewhat ahead of the science on this, which is another reason I wanted to cover this. Now, Professor uh, Eleanor Ridley, Immunologist, University of Edinburgh, she says this. We could be digging ourselves into a hole for a very long time where we think that we can only keep COVID away by boosting every year as opposed to natural immunity. So is it time to start focusing on natural immunity rather than vaccine-induced immunity for those that have already had two vaccines? So what we know is that people have natural immunity and then they have two vaccine doses. They end up with even higher levels of immunity than people who had the infection alone or people who had two doses of the vaccine alone. But what seems to be coming out here now, and we don't have definitive data on this, but it's, it, this is overwhelmingly probable, that if you have two doses of vaccine followed by a minimally symptomatic or ace, hopefully minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic infection, that's going to give you that boost in immunity as well. Which, of course, means that it might actually be good for me, as I've had two vaccines, to actually expose myself to the virus. So let's look at why we're, we're thinking this. Uh, Professor uh, Adam Fing, government vaccine advisor, over vaccinating people when other parts of the world have none, which of course is another issue here, uh, a bit insane. It's not just inequitable, it's stupid. And what he's thinking there, of course, is if the, the virus is multiplying rampantly in poorer countries that don't have access to the vaccine, then there could be other mutations, which are, of course are going to spread back to us just in the same way that the Delta variant spread back to China, where the virus came from in the first place. Um, so, so this is from this uh, Nature article here. SARS coronavirus 2 belongs to the beta coronavirus family, we know. It's the seventh known coronavirus to infect humans. That's all. There's only been, it's only the seventh. Four cases caused the common cold. Now, th th these are the coronaviruses, that one, that one, that one, and that one. And they all cause the common cold. The ones that cause severe diseases, SARS coronavirus 2 first, sorry, SARS coronavirus 1, my apologies, SARS coronavirus 1, or what's just SARS, what's just called SARS coronavirus, identified in 2002 to the 2003 uh, outbreak. Middle East respiratory syndrome from Campbell's first identified in 2012, and then 
the one we now have, the 2019 first identified virus. So they're the only seven we have. And of course, we have virtually no outbreaks of that now. Well, we do have some outbreaks, but it doesn't spread. Some, some direct transmission from camels. And this one's been er eradicated. So that is optimistic. These are circulating, but cause minimally symptomatic disease. They cause common colds, basically. Now, sars coronavirus 2 just a little bit of biology. It's a single-stranded RNA envelope virus, which we know. The entire genome, in other words, the number of genetic letters in its code is 29,881. Now, this is opposed to about 3.1 billion letters in use. So, in some ways, it's a very simple structure. Uh, and that encodes for 9,860 amino acids. But of that, only 28 proteins are essential for infection. But still, 28 proteins is quite a lot. And I'll show you why I wanted to do this, because it's actually quite important that there's a 28 proteins in the virus that are necessary for infection. So the first thing we want to look at is breadth of immunity. Um, how, much of the, uh, how much of the virus the immune system learns to attack? Because natural infection is going to be much more polyclonal. So if you've had the Moderna, Moderna or the Pfizer or the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, that's just attacking the spike proteins. Basically one, one protein. Um, but if you've had the natural infection, then your immune system has got 28 different proteins to target. So you can see there's a lot more, there's a lot more immunity potentially being generated from 28 different antigens, things the immune system recognises as being foreign as opposed to just uh, one or two. Uh, the vaccines do keep people out of hospital, which is good because the spike protein is the part that actually gets into infect cells. But 28 proteins recognised give the lymphocytes... Uh, what, now, I've made this up a target-rich environment. So this is what we call the B cells, the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes. And you remember that the B lymphocytes make the antibodies and the T lymphocytes stimulate the B cells to make the antibodies. And also we get these T cells that kill infected cells called T cytotoxic. Which are probably the main actual immune component fighting this virus. So if we have the vaccine, the B cells and the T cells can learn to recognise the spike protein by artificially giving the spike protein. If we actually have the infection, 28 proteins will learn to be recognised by these cells. Therefore, these cells can attack all 28. And this explains why people that have had the natural infection followed by two vaccines are even more immune. And therefore, why I believe that two vaccines followed by the natural infection, the other way around, will, will make us more immune. So um, it takes on to some quite interesting areas of thought, this really. Professor Eleanor Wrigley, immunologist, University of Edinburgh. That means you've had a real humdinger of an infection. <laughs> interesting medical term, but that, we know what she means. You may have better immunity to any new variants that pop up as your immunity is more than just the spike. So a lot of the, a lot of the mutations that have occurred so far have been in the spike protein that's caused the virus to spread more. But of course, the virus is vulnerable to attack by the immune system or any one of the 28 other proteins. So the natural infection could well boost the immune system really quite significantly. And because if there's a, a mutation in the spike protein, but the, uh, the immune system learns to attack all the other proteins, then the, the immune system can kill, still kill the virus via the 27 other proteins. So um, that's one point, breadth of immunity. Um, Breadth of immunity, definitely better after natural uh, infection. No debate about that at the moment. Uh, strength of immunity, the power to prevent infections and cause serious disease is another factor. And we know that the vaccines are actually doing quite well on that. But there again, we know that people have had the natural infection plus two vaccines do even better on that. So I am postulating or believe at the moment that Two vaccines followed by the natural infection will probably have the same effect. Interesting. Uh, in the case of breakthrough infection, so breakthrough infection from the vaccines or reinfection, if someone's had the natural viral infection already, uh, asymptomatic people get low levels of antibodies. Symptomatic people or ill get high levels of antibodies. So here in the people that are asymptomatic, it's as if the immune system 
doesn't need to bother making more antibodies. Presumably, because the body's got rid of the virus with the B and the T cells, it doesn't need to produce the antibodies. It can already do that. And it's only people that are symptomatic or real that have to go to all the bother of making the large number of antibodies to get rid of it, because, of course, antibodies is only one component of the immune system. Next one is duration, longevity of immunity. Now, this paper here, Naturally Enhanced Neutralization, uh, Breadth Against sars cov to one year after infection. <clears throat> now, this is this paper here. So do check that out for yourself. Now, um, natural infection. If someone's had natural infection and no vaccination, antibodies to the receptor binding domain are active after a year. So they still have active antibodies after a year. And presumably, in fact, the research says that receptor binding domain specific memory B cells active and relatively stable between six and 12 months. Now, if someone's had the natural infection, these particular tests have been testing for the spike protein, the receptor binding domain part of the spike protein. That's what the tests have been looking for. But given that people have had the natural infection, I think we can assume it's safe to assume they've had the other tw they've got the other 27 that the other 27 proteins have acted as an antigen and also stimulated B cells for the other 27 proteins, the other 27 antigens. So 6 to 12 months remaining relatively stable after infection, which is pretty good news. Data beyond 12 months we don't yet have. The time hasn't sufficiently elapsed for the studies to be completed. Vaccination further increases all components of the humoral immune system. That's the uh, the part of the immune system in the body fluids and that results in serum neutralizing activity against variants of concern so this is interesting so what this is saying is people that have had the natural immunity that have had the natural virus this is the key point really people that have had natural viral infection are less susceptible to variants of concern we don't get the reduction in immunity that we do get with the vaccines, which were originally made, of course, for the original wild type virus. Now it's a bit complicated, this, but it's uh, it's quite quite powerful thoughts, really. Uh, similar to or greater than neutralizing activity against the original Wuhan uh, HU1 strain. So what this is saying is people that have made their own people that have made their own immune response by being exposed to the virus their level of immunity against the new variants is basically as good as it was to the original virus. Whereas with the vaccines, we know the immunity is not as good as it was to the original virus for which the vaccines were designed to combat. Uh, right, so, um, and it's, it's, also, it's also, this is achieved by vaccination of naive individuals. In, in other words, the natural infection is working as well as people that were vaccinated. A direct quote from the paper, the, the data suggests that immunity in convalescent individuals will be very long lasting. Sounds good. And that convalescent individuals who received available mRNA vaccines will produce antibodies and memory B cells that should be protective against circulating sars coronavirus 2 variants. But we know that people with the natural immunity have even better protection against the new variants of concern. Now, the next thing is about the anatomical location of the immunity. So basically, the, the immunity comes from two parts of the body. So there's what we call immunoglobulin type A's that are in the nose and the mouth and the throat in the mucous membranes in the mucus. They're immunoglobulin type A's and the immunoglobulin type M and G's, they're in the blood. They're in the blood. So that actually makes a bit of a difference. So mu mucous membranes for immunoglobulin type A's and immunoglobulin M's that are made first and the longer lasting immunoglobulin G's are in the blood. So that's interesting because what this means is that this kind of explains why people who've been doubly vaccinated usually get common cold type symptoms. Because the vaccine, of course, is going into the body fluid, so it's going into the blood. So you make the IgM's and the IgG's. But as far as we know, the vaccine doesn't make us make the immunoglobulin type A's that go into the mucous membrane. So what that means, if someone is exposed to the virus, the mucous membrane is vulnerable to infection and we can get the headache, the, the uh, runny, runny nose and the sore throat. But because the 
protection against the virus is in the blood, we don't get systemically ill all over. So that's another important point of the way this is working and it explains really quite perfectly actually. It really explains quite perfectly why people just get common cold type symptoms after vaccine and the majority of them don't get ill. So um, professor from uh, University of Oxford, um, Paul, Paul uh, Kleinerman from Oxford, location of an infection makes a difference even if it's the same virus. So this is in agreement with what we just said. So we would expect, so we would expect important differences between natural infection and vaccines, because of course the natural infections will produce the immunoglobulin A in the mucous membranes, whereas the vaccine won't. So current questions. Do vaccinate adult, adults need to, need to be boosted or is exposure to the virus enough? Or you could rephrase this by saying, is natural exposure to the virus after vaccination significantly preferable to an extra booster dose of vaccine because they're going to get this more polyclonal response, including the protection of the mucous membranes? Uh, I think the answer to that is probably yes at the moment. Do children need vaccination at all? Or does a lifetime of ongoing exposure to the virus build up good immune defence? Well, we, we know that exposure to virus builds up a good response because we get immune top-ups that occur with respiratory syncytial virus for example rhinovirus is common cold virus and other coronaviruses so exposure to the ongoing exposure to the virus is going to give ongoing generation of immunity now i'll just illustrate this with a story from the the way that vaccines were discovered so edward jenner inoculated an eight-year-old boy i think it was james phipps and he inoculated him, and I'm using the term inoculation correctly there. He inoculated him with uh, cowpox pus, and he put it into his arm and he rubbed it in. So you would expect that that gave James immunity to cowpox, and we believe it did. But then what Edward Jenner did after about six weeks was he exposed James Phipps not to cowpox, but to smallpox. And to everyone's delight, and I'm sure James and his family's relief, he did not get smallpox. So this, the cowpox had this cross immunity to, to uh, smallpox, which is just brilliant because smallpox is a devastating disease. And then about a year after, Edward Jenner exposed James to uh, smallpox again. And then a year or two after that, he exposed him again. Then a year or two after that, he exposed him again. So he exposed him quite a few times throughout. I think it was about a 20 year period. And from that, Edward Jenner thought that the exposure to the original cowpox was having this long lasting immune effect but what was actually happening is every time James was being exposed to the smallpox he was protected by previous exposure to smallpox and then from the first time he was exposed to smallpox he was being protected against previous exposure to cowpox so it was the ongoing exposure that gave him life long immunity and there's no reason to think exactly the same thing won't happen with exposure to SARS coronavirus too doesn't mean to say we haven't got an immediate problem, especially in the United States, because a lot of people are not vaccinated, therefore susceptible to the systemic illness, getting into the body, making them sick. That's the current problem at the moment. But long term, I can actually feel a bit of optimism emerging as I'm saying this, actually. So, Professor Adam Flynn, government vaccine advisor. This isn't proven, but it could be a lot cheaper and simpler to, to let that happen than spend the whole time immunising people with vaccines. We could end up locked into a, a cycle of boosting without seeing if it was necessary. Because what I've said is it probably will not be necessary. So the regulatory authorities in the States and the regulatory authorities in the UK have not yet said we're going to need booster doses. This is the politicians that seem to be saying this, which is, to be quite honest, it's a bit disappointing that politicians are jumping the gun. In children, the argument has already been won, according to Professor Flynn. Uh, so basically, Professor Flynn here is saying that children under the age of 12 do not need vaccinated. 40 to 50 percent have already been infected and most weren't ill or particularly ill. And because they've had the natural infection, especially if they get the natural infection, then they get the natural infection again. We would expect their level of immunity to be higher. And very often the children are asymptomatic on the first time. And there will be you would expect a much higher proportion of the children to be asymptomatic if they were re-exposed as these viruses are constantly circulating as the other four coronaviruses do 
as rhinoviruses do, as respiratory syncytial viruses do, and probably 10,000 other viruses that we've never heard of. Final word to Professor Eleanor Wrigley, immunologist, University of Edinburgh. Using vaccines to take the edge off COVID is a good idea, followed by infection. Followed by infection. So vaccination followed by natural exposure next time you are in the pub or go to a public place, especially an indoor place. Uh, to, and that will broaden the immune response. It will be a more polyclonal immune response. You will generate immunity to all 28 of the virus proteins that are necessary for infection, not just one or two of them. We really need to consider, are we justified in, uh, are, are we just frightening people rather than giving them the confidence to get on with their lives? We are close to just worrying people now direct quote from Professor uh, Eleanor Ridley, Ridley. So there we go. Um, now, provisos here, people that uh, are immunocompromised might need three, four, five shots of the vaccine before they generate an immune response. But it may well be that government regulatory bodies decide that for most of us, a third dose of the vaccine is not necessary because we're going to be naturally exposed during the time period this virus is endemic and from what we've said we've got good scientific reasons to believe that will give us a higher quality of immunity and potentially a longer lived quality of immunity so can't make any recommendations now we wait for the fda the cdc the british european regulatory authorities to make a decision on this but i'm pretty sure from consideration of those points in the science that is the way they are going to go for most of us I strongly suspect which of course is remarkably remarkably good news because we're going to have long-term immunity boosted by a few years exposures to the virus over the next season or two or three or four so I think that's the way this pandemic is going to go and I think that's optimistic what we'd really like to do, of course, is get everyone in the world to have two doses of vaccines so that everyone would gain the benefit of getting natural exposure to the virus while covered, while, it, while co having immune cover uh, from, from the original, uh, va from their vaccination. This is what we call active on passive immunity, well, active on active immunity. So you generate active immunity, really, with the vaccine. Then you get active immune boosting again after that. And you don't get the infection on most occasions because you're already covered by the original active vaccination immunity. So there we go. I, hope that, I know that was a bit difficult, but uh, I think I think that really spells out why we can be why why I am personally currently quite optimistic about this becoming a, an inconvenience rather than a major ongoing health problem as long as we can get those original uh, initial vaccines rolled out. Now, we're going to go to a report now from the United States, Jeff in Mississippi. Now, Mississippi, we know very high hospitalizations at the moment, a lot of unvaccinated people. Vaccination rates there have gone up, but it's going to take time for that immunity to kick in. This is the concern we've been talking about. But over to Jeff, who lives there, so uh, is more authoritative than me. Thank you, Jeff. Hello, Dr. Campbell and viewers. Welcome to the state of Mississippi. Sort of. My name is Jeff, and I've been living in the state for the last 19 years. And like many of you, I have been watching this channel since the very beginning of the pandemic. I've also been watching our COVID numbers in the state as well. I want to give you just a brief sort of a situational analysis of what's going on here in our state. So let's go ahead and let's uh, review some data. Okay, our data sources are from the uh, Mississippi uh, State Department of Health, uh, the Center for, of, Center for Disease Control, and healthdata.gov. All of this was obtained on the 17th of August. Okay, good news on our vaccinations. Uh, they are increasing. We had 70,000 people come in and become vaccinated just last week. So a good upswing, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. On the uh, K through 12 school situations, 
uh, the colleges and universities regarding mandating masks, we do have good news there. 80% of the K-12 through are mandating masks. 100% uh, of the colleges and universities uh, are mandating masks as, as well. Fortunately, we do not have any ban on mask mandates as is in some other states. Uh, COVID cases during the last three and a half weeks only showed 2% fully vaccinated. That's extremely good given the fact that it is the Co the uh, Delta variant. We're also having some monoclonal antibody therapy uh, that will start next week in the uh, capital of Jackson. Here we got our chart here for the cases, hospitalizations, and deaths here from uh, July 20th through August the 16th. And you can see there at the bottom there, 2% fully vaccinated, so very good on that. 11% on hospitalizations and 14 on deaths. We've had a 23% increase in cases in the last 10 days, our single highest uh, increase uh, for one day was on August 12th. That was at uh, just slightly over 5,000 cases. Okay, uh, our hospitalizations and deaths are increasing. Let's look at our last 10 days here. 20% increase in hospitalizations, 29% in ICUs, 54 on ventilators, and 33 on deaths. This is the chart I used to get those information from. That information from, if you look at uh, about the 20, rather the 12th of August, that's when we breached the alpha variant hospitalization. Uh, we peaked at that point in January. We are now uh, in new territory on on hospitalizations. This is from healthdata.gov. Uh, if you ever want to know about your particular state in detail regarding the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, every week they make a report in PDF form and it has a lot of information, probably more information you probably want to look at. But uh, this one here was compiled for us uh, on the 13th of August, showing here 773 new COVID cases per 100,000. That increased 57% from the previous week. We are the lowest vaccinated state per 100,000. 36% fully vaccinated, and that was uh, up as 1% uh, last week. So those 70,000 people, that just made 1%. Uh, so we need to have more and more people come in and get vaccinated. We have 82 counties, and not one of them is above 49% fully vaccinated, and a few of those are actually in the teens. Okay, here's our underlying issues here. We are the lowest state in the nation for accessible health care. This was compiled uh, a couple years ago from U.S. News and World, World Report. And of course, we need to have everybody in a pandemic as, as accessible as possible to healthcare. And uh, we started off at the, at the lowest. We have high co comorbidities. We also have the uh, second highest in obesity, both for adults and kids. We're the highest state in poverty at 19%. That has health issues as well. And uh, we have a higher amount of people with disabilities than in other states. Not the highest, but higher than, than, than the average. And some of the adjacent states do share some of this some, similar situation, particularly with the low vaccinated uh, states, as, as mentioned earlier. Okay, uh, we have 82 beds uh, that were made in a parking structure at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson. That kind of shows you the situation there. We There were talk last week of a possible hospital failure. That We haven't heard that in the last, uh, last couple of days, so that's good. But uh, it's still, there's always that potential. Uh, oddly enough, we're actually the third highest COVID-19 mortality rate per capita in the country. Uh, that's kind of very surprising indeed. Our staffing situation is, is the thing. Uh, we have beds available. We do not have the staffing to man those beds. That's the big problem throughout the, throughout the, night, throughout the states. The Mississippi Emergency Management Agency 
received nearly 1,400 requests from uh, 73 hospitals uh, across the state recent, re recently. And uh, if you look at the numbers here, 90, 920 are nurses and 239 are respiratory technicians. Those are needed uh, today. Our state health officer, Dr. Thomas Dobbs, doing a tremendous job saying that we are at the worst part of the pandemic and uh, it is continuing to worsen. Uh, going back to the disabilities, he believes that we may have a wave of new disabilities coming in the state. And of course, that is something that obviously with long COVID that has, uh, as we learned in this channel, can, can really um, pause issues with, with a person that may not be able to work for some time. Our uh, governor has been defiant on issuing any mask mandates, uh, single focused on vaccination and not masks. Of course, everybody knows that we've been, everybody watches this channel knows there's a five week wait from the first jab to fully vaccinated, plenty of time to get exposed. A map here of our case positivities, hospitalizations, and deaths. Primarily, if you see here, is it the lower section of the state, lower and mid-sections of the state? That's where a lot of the low vaccination rates are. We've had outbreaks in schools already the first week of 342 schools reporting the first week of school, 20% of those had outbreaks. Second week, which is the majority of the schools that open, 35%. Uh, about 1,500 teachers tested positive last week and, and nearly 6,000 students. Currently, 20,000 students are in quarantine to do uh, uh, virtual learning from home while the, while the uh, quarantine. Now, ventilating of... Uh, Everybody knows that uh, Dr. Campbell has been very, uh, I mean, it's apparently uh, very well known that ventilating is the key here. Unfortunately for our weather situations, that's almost impossible. We have 90 degree days nearly every day uh, and nearly about 100 uh, degree on the heat indices. Maybe in November we might be able to kind of do that. Hopefully we'll be finished by then on this particular wave. Let's look at the uh, regional aspect here. Uh, interesting, for the last seven days, Mississippi cases uh, per 100,000 at 798. Look down at Florida, they're at the bottom, they're at 710. We have 3 million people, they have 21 million people. And it kind of goes to show that uh, you know how, how thick we are in this. Look at Louisiana, they're actually 811. Actually, they're worse than we are. They had mask mandates actually since uh, July 29th, uh, but I think they started too late. It kind of got out of hand. All right, are we close to our peak? Well, according to IHME, we are. Uh, they're painting uh, about August the 25th. Now, this is a very controversial uh, projection uh, the, the IHMEs had uh, friends and foes since last year uh, I don't believe I do not believe this uh, I think this will be carrying further than that but we'll see uh, I, I picked the worst case scenario and it, it showed up August 25th I hope it's right CDC does something similar if you look at the right side uh, they have model ensembles here and oddly enough, uh, they're pointing to the third week in August as well. So maybe uh, it would be it would be very nice if we can kind of see sort of the light at the end of the tunnel here soon. All right, well we have maybe a rolling delta wave uh, going forward. Uh, we've got a we're going to have an upcoming spike uh, coming up September sixth. That's our Labor Day here in the United States, and we always have a spike after any holiday. Even Halloween actually will we had a spike last year. So we'll just, we'll just have to see. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning about the rolling wave is I've noticed some other states here that they are still like Missouri still having positive cases, high positive cases, 
uh, even though they've had a uh, their death uh, uh, rates have uh, almost gone down to zero. So it's kind of puzzling. Uh, they actually had a death spike uh, just uh, a few days ago on on the data. Alabama saw the, the, the same way they had a death spike last week. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on on there. We will have to just monitor that. Okay, in closing, my personal thoughts are, even if we did have a mask mandate, based on my observations with the alpha variant wave, about only 65 to 75% of people masked at best. So... If we did have mask mandates, you'll see about 25 to 35 people walking around without them. Uh, misinformation on social media, uh, like I say, it's, it's like a disease itself. Um, I have likened this Delta wave sort of like the Titanic disaster. It is something that could have been avoided if proper decisions were made, and unfortunately they did not. However, we can sort of take an analogy here. Uh, you can think of the vaccines as, uh, as lifeboats, as we've seen just a 2% positivity rate uh, for the last three, three weeks. If, if that helps people uh, you know, get vaccinated, then, then, then uh, so be it. But uh, this is something that I think we we'll just have to, to watch and see. Our, um, we, we, we have some issues here that kind of make things a little bit disconcerting going forward, especially with the disabilities. So thank you all for uh, sticking around, uh, listening to me drone on, and all those in the uh, United States and also abroad. Please take care of yourself and uh, stay well. Thanks very much for that, Jeff. What a concise report. <laughs> Absolutely crammed full of uh, interesting information. The thing is, the hospitalizations and the deaths are going to go up a bit yet because that's kind of baked in because there's so many people not vaccinated. I'm afraid that's inevitable. Let's hope the spike is as early as they thought. The spikes in, in uh, deaths can sometimes be reporting issues. So, so that could be a, a factor in that, that sometimes there's a delay and then someone gets their act together and a lot of deaths are all kind of reported on the same day so so that's possible but uh, excellent report there jeff thank you very much for that very comprehensive hope you found it interesting and of course things to learn from everywhere from the mississippi experience so thanks jeff excellent we appreciate that and and thank you for watching <laughs>